If you're like me, you have been listening to a lot of Encanto lately, watching a lot of Encanto. I have four small children, we have Disney Plus, and uh, Encanto is on there an awful lot. You've probably been not talking about Bruno a lot. And something has been striking me as I've been watching and listening to this movie a lot that I wanted to talk about today. I want to ask the question, is Encanto a profoundly or fundamentally Catholic movie? Or at least, are there some really strong Catholic themes in Encanto? And I want to talk about three different ways that I think that's the case. The first thing I want to talk about is the whole concept of the gift or the miracle that the family Madrigal receives. Right? So think about the language even that's used for what happens to the Madrigal family. In the beginning, Abuela is talking about the candle and how they received this miracle, and she talks about it as a miracle. As a gift, she uses language of blessing. Right, The different powers, magical powers, that the family members have are called gifts. And these are words that all imply a higher power. It's a, definitely a supernatural gift. It comes from outside of the order, the normal order that they live in. Now, there, I think there are even ways that the specific gifts that the family members get can be paralleled with Christian spiritual gifts, especially as they're described in St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. I'll talk about a couple of those. Louisa has great strength. This is, could this be like the feats of power that St. Paul describes in 1 Corinthians? Julieta has he, about the power of healing, a common spiritual gift referred to in 1 Corinthians and a, a common Christian, a commonly understood Christian gift. Bruno has the gift of prophecy, another gift described by St. Paul. And we're going to come back to Bruno because I think that the story and I think the Catholic theme really kind of revolves around Bruno's prophecy. Now, the other ones are a little bit, maybe a little bit shakier, although I have some ideas. I think Camillo, who is a shapeshifter, St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that he became as all things to all people. Now, of course, St. Paul didn't mean that he was physically shapeshifting, but he did mean that he adapted himself to different circumstances in order to bring Christ to all people. Dolores, Antonio, Isabella. Dolores, I'm going to say she has the gift of interpretation of tongues because she can hear and understand all people. Antonio's gift of talking to the animals reminds me of the prophet Isaiah, who says that the wolf will become the guest of the lamb. The animals live together without eating each other. Uh, Isabella's gift with the flowers, I think, is more, uh, more speaks to the beauty of creation. She has the ability to create beauty in the world. And the thing about the gifts is their purpose, right? The scriptures tell us, 1 Corinthians tells us especially, that get all the gifts that are given to God's people are not given to his people for their own glory, are not given to people for their just their own benefit, but are given to be used together as a body uses all of its faculties in order to benefit the world. And that's kind of the central idea of the miracle in the family Madrigal as well. Right, that their gifts were not just given to them for their glory or to be used for selfishly, but to be used for the sake of the family and then for the sake of the whole Encanto, the whole village as well. Right, so many gifts, one body, I think, is a very strong theme in Encanto. The second theme really, to me, comes down to the center of the plot of Encanto, and it's about the dignity of the person. Right? The question is, what makes us who we are? What makes us, in a sense, um, loved? Is it what we do? Or is it the simple fact of who we are? Now, the scriptures, starting in the book of Genesis, tell, tell us that humanity is created in the image and likeness of God. 
That's something that none of the other creatures, including the angels, have. And it's the basis for why we respect every human being fundamentally. Way before we think about what humans do, we respect the dignity of every person because of who we are. We're the children that God loved so much that he created us. Right? Those of us who are parents think about that with our children as well. When it comes down to it, we love our children because they're ours, not because of any good qualities they might have. And their bad qualities don't make us stop loving them. This is really, I think, at the center of the story. And I want to go down to how a few of the characters embody this. Number one, Mirabel, the central character of the story. Her whole, her whole plot is focused around the fact that she doesn't have one of these great supernatural gifts that everyone else has. And it, it has kind of made her a second-class citizen in her own family. She has to figure out how she fits into the family Madrigal and how she helps it achieve its goal. Luisa. And I, I bring her up next because her song is next and her song Surface Pressure is very memorable. And it seems to me that that song is all about her struggle with who she is versus what she can do. Right? In that song, she talks about how much pressure her gift puts on her. That it seems like others put burdens on her because of what she can do physically and they think that she can just handle it. And when her strength starts fading, she's terrified that she's losing who she is. She has the, the great line, I'm pretty sure I'm worthless if I can't be of service. So she's forgotten that her value depends on who she is before it's what she does. The same goes for Isabella. And this is expressed in her song, What Else Can I Do? Where it's it's been made clear that she's been kind of put into this very restricted position where she's supposed to create roses and very graceful ordered formations of roses. And so her song is a little bit, I think a little bit more about being f a little more free to use her gift and express herself a little bit more than just being kind of pigeonholed into this idea of who people think she's supposed to be. Bruno, Tio Bruno, of course, of course. Tio Bruno has literally been rejected by the family especially Abuela, but also Peppa and Felix because of his, because of his gift. For the whole first part of the story, the Bruno's character is not, he's not the son of Abuela. He's not the uncle to Mirabel and her cousins. He's not the brother to Peppa and Julieta. He's this, he's this guy who had a vision that everyone was scared of. He's this guy who had all these visions that people didn't like. And so it's actually what he does leads to him being rejected by the family. And we'll come back to the fact that what he does is actually a faithful use of his gift. He hasn't actually done anything wrong, but he's been rejected. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 356, says, quote, of all visible creatures, only man is able to know and love his creator. He is the only creature on earth that God has willed for its own sake, and he alone is called to share by knowledge and love in God's own life. God has willed humans for their own sake, out of pure love, not because of any of these gifts that they have or things that they do. And I think the, the turning point in the story is really... Abuela realizing that she has forgotten this, right? So the, the, the setup of the story is about the different people, how they fit in with their different gifts, how they maybe have been rejected because of their gifts. Abuela kind of looks down on Mirabel because she doesn't have a gift. She tells Mirabel to stay out of the way. Abuela has put, clearly has put a lot of pressure on Luisa and Isabella to use their gifts in certain ways. And Abuela ultimately was the driving factor in Bruno leaving, disappearing, because Abuela didn't like the vision that he had. And 
So the climactic moment of the movie, the, the face-off between Mirabel and Abuela about the gifts and about the family is about just that. The family ends up breaking, and it's only in the breaking of the family that Abuela realizes she needs to return to the family, talk to them, approach them as her beloved children and grandchildren, and not just as manifestations of these gifts, right? She's kind of forgotten their dignity, especially Mirabel and Bruno, but everyone really. She's put this immense pressure on them and kind of forgotten about them. And when the family is able to come back together and reconcile between themselves just as persons, really when Abuela tells Mirabel the story at the riverside, and then when Abuela hugs Bruno, I think that's where the family is reconciled, and that's what allows the miracle to return, right? So lastly, I want to talk about who I think is the most remarkable character in the story, Bruno. Now, Bruno is two things that I want to suggest to you. He's two things in this story. He's a monk, and he's a prophet. All right. I know you think you, probably, you may be thinking I'm crazy at first, uh, but let's let's talk about Bruno for a minute. First, I, I'm sure you're thinking we don't talk about Bruno. No, 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 no. All right. So now that that's in your head, let's talk about Bruno. Bruno the monk. So let's just start off with kind of um, surface things, superficial things. What is Bruno wearing when we meet him? When we see him in the flashbacks? At Peppa and Felix's wedding, he's wearing a robe that covers his face. What is he wearing when Mirabel meets him behind the walls? He's wearing a robe. Remember when he pretends to be Hernando, who is scared of nothing, and Jorge, who makes the spackle. He's wearing a robe that comes down over his, his eyes, reminiscent of a traditional monastic robe. He also lives a life apart. Even before he disappeared from the family, he remember when Mirabel goes to his door and she goes looking for his tower, it is physically set apart pretty far from the rest of the family. And then, of course, when he disappears and is living within the walls, then he's living a life truly apart from the community of the family. He no, he no longer eats meals with them, no longer speaks to them, he hides from them. Right? So there's a kind of monastic figure wearing distinctive dress, living apart from the rest of society. And this connection to me becomes even more amazing when you learn a little bit about someone that shares a name with Bruno, and that is Saint Bruno. Saint Bruno of Cologne, who was an 11th century French monk who left his monastic community to found a new community. The community that he founded was called the Carthusians. And the Carthusians are still with us. They're, they're all over the world. We may not know a lot about them because they live a very separated life. They live lives that are very much dedicated to prayer and study, isolated from the world in their monasteries. They actually gained a little bit of notoriety in 2005, when a documentary came out called Into Great Silence, which was a movie documenting their, their silent lifestyle. And so while we don't talk about Bruno, Bruno and his monks also don't talk about us. It's, I think, pretty remarkable. And lastly, I want to talk about Bruno as a prophet. Now, we have this idea that prophets predict the future, right? Now, when you look at the scriptures, the Old Testament, the New Testament, prophecy is not really a gift that is about predicting the future. What it is about is about speaking on behalf of God. That is the basic definition of a prophet, is one who speaks on God's behalf. Now, that often involves the future because what the prophets usually do is they come and tell people, listen, you need to change the way you're living or there are going to be negative consequences for that in the future. So that's where the future part comes in. 
If you think about it, this is what Bruno's prophecy does in Encanto as well. His visions are not so much about the future as they are about the present. His vision of Peppa and Felix's wedding, he says near the end of the movie, he wasn't predicting that it was going to rain, much less was he causing the rain. He came to talk to them because he could see that Peppa was starting to get upset. And so his vision was actually about the present. Now, the vision that drives the plot is the vision of Mirabel and the house, right? That has more than one facet to it. The house is either broken or it's not. This is very much not a prediction of the future. It's a statement about the present, even though Bruno doesn't totally understand it. But what he, in the end, what he's ultimately saying is that you, the family Madrigal, need to change the way you're acting, need to reevaluate how you look at these gifts and how you use them and how you look at other people, or the house is going to crack and fall apart. That would be the consequences if you don't change your current behavior. One of the things about prophets is that they are almost always rejected by the people that they are sent to. There's a remarkable scene in the first book of Samuel where Samuel goes to Bethlehem to find the next king of Israel, right, which will be King David. And when he approaches the town, uh, to, to paraphrase, the book says that the people in the village approached him trembling with fear and asked, is your visit peaceful? Because people expected prophets to come with these messages of doom and gloom or expected them to come and, and, and condemn them or, or co rather condemn their behavior and call them to something better. And so people most often reject the prophets. And that's exactly what happens to Bruno. His vision, which was a faithful statement about the family and about the, their possible futures, is what gets him rejected from the family, just like a biblical prophet. Which I think is just, I think is really remarkable. So to finish up, what am I, what am I saying and what am I not saying? Well, I'm not saying that Encanto is a secret vehicle for Catholic teaching. I'm not saying that Disney or Lin-Manuel Miranda decided to make a movie and hide Catholic themes in it or hide Catholic teaching in it in order to inculcate Catholic belief. I definitely do not think that is what Disney is doing. But I am saying two things. One, uh, it relates to Hispanic culture or Colombian culture. Now, I'll leave, I'll kinda, I'm going to leave this one kind of to the experts on Hispanic culture and on Colombian culture because I'm not that. But I am an expert on Catholic teaching and I wonder if perhaps, if you're going to make an authentically Colombian movie, an authentically Hispanic movie, perhaps Catholic thought, Catholic teaching, Catholic practice are so woven into those cultures that maybe making an authentic Colombian movie means making a movie with Catholic themes in it. And I'd be very interested to hear other people's perspectives on that. But what I also think a little more, ba a little more fundamentally is that Encanto is a fairy tale, and fairy tales are ultimately about the lessons that we take from them and the lessons that our children take from them. And I, I do think Encanto is more rich with Catholic lessons than a lot of Disney movies. And believe me, I have four children ranging from ages 2 to 11. I have seen all the Disney movies, and I think that Encanto is sort of more shot through than most of them, possibly than any of them, with lessons and parallels with our Catholic faith. So I think this is a really interesting topic for discussion. I would love to hear anybody's input on this or feedback. Uh, is Encanto the most Catholic Disney movie that you've seen? Is there another one that has, you think, a stronger Catholic element to it? Uh, so, hey, leave comments below this video or email me or look for me on Facebook or anything. I'd love to hear your comments. 
And may God bless you. And remember, we don't talk about Bruno. No, 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 no.